Hi, this is Kaisa Carlson, Deputy Editor of the Zine, and I'm broadcasting live from the Zine's brand new studio space in London. Today, we're teaming up with Philips TV and Sound to continue our series of live panel discussions exploring the cutting edge of product design. This third talk is called How to Design a Beautiful TV, and it will take the form of a live case study investigating how Philips has collaborated with Quadrat and Bowers and Wilkins to design the OLED 986 and 936 televisions. I'm pleased to say that I'm joined today by Rod White, Chief Design Officer at Philips TV and Sound, Stine Find Oster, Vice President of Design at Quadrat, and Andy Kerr, Director of Product Marketing at Bowers and Wilkins. Instead of me introducing the three of you, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves to our viewers, starting with Rod. Hi, Rod, uh, please hi. introduce yourself. <laughs> hi, sorry. Uh, hi there. Um, well, together with the design team here in Amsterdam, I'm responsible for the creation of the Philips TV and sound products. Perfect. Thank you so much. And moving on to Stine, if you could please introduce yourself. yourself. Yeah, thank you. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm, I am a Quadrat teenager, have been a part of Quadrat for 14 years, and today I'm overseeing the creative direction for our product developments across brands. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. And then finally, we've got Andy with us as well. Hi, guys. So my name is Andy Kerr. I work at the Research and Development Facility in the UK for Bowers & Wilkins in product development alongside the R&D team. Great. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And I understand that you've prepared a presentation that you're going to share with me. So uh, yeah, please talk us through it. Okay. So just tell me when you can see this. I can see it. Yep. Okay. So uh, in, in general, we've put it together, the three of us. Uh, so there will be, it'll be a joint explanation of how we got to uh, the final products. Um, we'll start with the, the, the TV. Basically, by now, there is no product to design around the TV screen itself. It's very much an edgeless experience. Obviously, with Philips, we also have Ambilight. So there's an immersive um, part of our DNA that brings the attention into the TV picture itself. But where do we go from there? So um, a few years ago, we created the 984, which is this, this is the initial sketch that took us there, where we already were working, obviously, with Burroughs and Wilkins and Quadrat. It was a very successful product, quite iconic floor standing unit with uh, the first generation of uh, fabrics that we created together. Uh, and on the back of that, we created uh, what you see here, basically the 935, again, a full uh, fabric wrap on the sound base, which is basically the table stand, iconic detailing on the Burrs and Wilkins tweeter, and in combination with a, a metal mesh. So that was a well-received award-winning uh, range that we created together across the brands. Um, and that was the, the high bar that would set ourselves uh, in order to take the next step into what you see, which was launched, launched a few weeks ago. So that's the, the starting point from, from Philips. So over to me. So um, this is is our flagship loudspeaker. This is an 801, um, part of our 800 series diamond range. Now, obviously, as you can see, there are significant differences and challenges in terms of um, the construction of the thing, the form factor of the thing. It's it's a very substantial piece. It's 100 kilograms in the case of each individual model. Um, and the materiality and the look of the materials is very important, of course, as well. We, we as in the particular case, you can see here, you've got an American walnut veneer. Um, a very natural surface, uh, a very open feel, uh, feel to the wood. It's very tactile. Um, there's uh, Connolly leather, leather by Connolly on the top of the cabinet. And as you can see also, we've got these, these raw metal component parts. But the thing that links it very much to what you can see in the 986 and the 936 that uh, Rob was just showing you is, is that component uh, right there, which is what we refer to as the tweeter on top. Now, the important part of it as not just a design element is it's an acoustically beneficial thing it has uh, a real functional role to play and it's its form is actually defined by very sound um, engineering principles and acoustic principles so we like to, to, to try and use it wherever we can it's clearly a key part of our dna something that we use in our flagship models and obviously something that we're very excited to have been able to deploy uh, in both of these tvs but then of course the challenges become 
how to do it, how to do it in a way that's honest and how to kind of maximize it and integrate it into the designs, obviously, that Rod and his team have been leading. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, and jumping to, to the textiles, this is a, a very nice picture from a famous restaurant called Ona in, in Norway, where we uh, have developed a space-specific fabric uh, fitting uh, specifically to this architecture. Um, and this is, uh, you can say that this fabric have uh, been on the more or less the same journey as the fabric uh, you have integrated in, in, in your television like looking at a specific need and then developing the fabric to, to meet these needs. And entering a room like this is, is like getting a hug because uh, we're adding so much uh, tactility in, into the room. On this picture, you see a newly launched uh, collection called Technicolor uh, designed by Peter Seville. And the unique uh, thing with this, uh, these textiles is that they exactly have the same starting point, but the product look, looks extremely different. And, and that was one of the aims to build with Peter Saville, that we didn't want it to repeat ourselves, but we wanted to unfold the same idea in six uh, different uh, versions uh, over three different uh, product categories. And on, on this picture, you see a, a mood board built up by Patricia Ricciola. Uh, we, a very important thing is, of course, to tell that we never design alone. We strongly be, believe in collaboration. So it means that we have an external designer beh behind each product. And here, Patricia is trying to, to tell a new story of, of nature, uh, looking into stones like marble and, and other kind of stones. So basically, those are the three quite separate but in some ways a uh, singular approach to creating new products um, which took us to uh, to where we are so basically for this product uh, we wanted to push the boundaries further in sound which Andy will touch upon uh, but that started with changing the form to ang angling the sides to have extra speakers and also having sound coming through the top surface so it's a combination of having acoustic transparency in the fabric combined with precision material use of steel in the front and how to make that clearly visible as a step on from the sound, but also visible in, in the store and also for the consumer at home. So both for the 9.3, but also for the 9.8, uh, six that you see here, again, bringing in the combination of materials. This was the, the challenge and also the starting point for the project. So these were the initial sketches. So I'm just basically stopping the PowerPoint at this point because we want to show you a movie, <laughs> which should come online now. And tell me when you see that. Uh huh. Okay. So Andy, please go for it. <clears throat> so um, the enclosure, as we call it, the space where the the drive units live, is is fundamental to the performance of the system and getting them to work effectively has some challenges in terms of uh, configuration and space, but also in terms of the impact on the PQ, the picture quality, because essentially drive units moving forwards and backwards creates a lot of vibration and resonance inside a system that can really impact on that picture. So it's a case of working harmoniously with Rod and team to get those spaces right, get those configurations right, and then also working very closely with Steiner and team to try and get uh, the acoustic transparency right. And that's obviously something we're going to come to in just a moment. But Essentially, the simplest way of explaining it is everything in loudspeaker design makes a difference. Uh, and of course, when you've got that plus certain challenges in terms of space, certain challenges in terms of options for, for engineering solutions, it becomes even more interesting. Fundamentally, doing this paradoxically is a lot harder than doing something like that because that's a self-contained entity, whereas a TV, we've got other things to do with as well. Speaking of which... Yeah, then something I uh, know a lot about is, is turning on, on the screen. And uh, I will just add a, a few words on, on the journey. Uh, all these, or most of these fabrics is made with the same starting point, um, a, a upholstery fabric with a very strong DNA of a very quiet multicolored uh, surface. 
And uh, this is uh, what makes uh, it unique for, for textiles that we can work uh, with colors in a very complex way. So it means that each surface is, is covering at least six colors uh, in these fabrics. This makes it work like almost a glue when you add it to a room or to a, a, a product because it, it somehow gathers the, the other materials around them. Uh, but of course, uh, upholstery is very dense because we need high abrasion and uh, no pilling. Uh, but this is not the needs uh, you were looking for. So of course, we need, needed to re-engineer this, uh, this product. And it was a journey of opening it up as much as possible until the, the border of uh, the fabric like losing its uh, DNA, you can say. And also uh, the see-through is, of course, also very important to not make it too uh, see-through, uh, then you, it will not work as a, a full cover material. So if I can add some, some character to that, I think if you look at the, the unit behind me, to our audience buying a product like that, they're perfectly happy looking at that exposed cone material, the drive unit that you can see right at the heart of the loudspeaker. That's something that they would expect and they're accustomed to. The TV buying customer probably has different expectations. So there are certain elements of the product that we do still working with Rod & Co celebrate, but a lot of the other elements need to be concealed. Now, of course, as you know, just saying, half the challenge of concealing them is uh, they have, as you can see, light properties behind them. So you have to have a degree of opaqueness so that you can't see through the material, because if you see through the material, you can see the structure behind, you can see the moving component parts behind, and people may not like that depending on the audience. At the same time, if you make it too opaque, you wind up with an issue where you're essentially masking the sound. And again, that somewhat becomes self-defeating. So it's a very interesting set of, of challenges to sort of work through to try to get that perfect harmonious mix of something that's fit for purpose acoustically, because fundamentally it is a speaker system, even if it's inside a television. And at the same time, also something that's fit for purpose aesthetically and from a design perspective. And it's been a very interesting and enjoyable process of learning and working on it over the course of the past few years. I agree. So I think it's a, it's a duality, actually. So we talk about our products having to stand out in the store. So there should be things around the design that make it attractive from a distance. Um, but also it, it spends most of its time in your living room and it has to fit in there with the elements that Stein was mentioning that allow the, the connection with other objects in your modern home uh, without overpowering, especially given the size of the TV. That's a complex challenge that we as a team have. So those were the uh, starting points. But basically the, this is where we got to. So for the 986 you see the detailing of the tweeter, uh, tweeter on top, as, as Andy was referring to it, with the burrs detailing on the mesh, coming together with the uh, the fabric from Quadrat on the top surface, combined with the micro mesh. So it's a lot of materials coming together. As, as a team, as an overall multi-brand team, we talk about a European design experience and very much the coming together of parts and finessed in a way that is believable when you get up close to this level of detail. It needs to come together in a way that is natural and not jarring to the, to the user or to the potential consumer. There's a lot of technology in this product. So you see the, the micro mesh going around the corner, allowing multiple drivers that you saw in the movie that Andy explained. And from a distance, it should be calm. It should be reassuring and easily fitting into such a space. But up close, you see the, the detailing that's got in there, the precise use of materials, of course, there's branding there, but it's not, not overpowering. Um, and in the end, it's the TV content that you're, you're there to watch. So the screen should be amazing. The Ambulite allows the TV to float. And the coming together of all of these materials are re reinforcing that uh, position. Similarly, for the 936, you see the, the uh, Quadrat very clearly up close. From a distance, it's quite subtle. But the tone on tone of the metal and the fabric allow it to deliver a great experience consistently. In this case, with the 9.3, then the tweeter is embedded slightly on top. Um, and basically, to close off, this is where we are. So this is from a distance, more or less, if you're in a, a decent store where there's a dark environment to let the Ambulite perform, that is from a distance what you're looking at. And then when you step up to the 9.86, obviously it's a floor articulation but you see the family look and the, the subtle coming together of the parts that deliver a great experience. So 
that's our story to kick off. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Rod. And uh, yeah, can I just say those are two really beautiful TVs. Uh, yes, so congrats to everyone <laughs> for your hard work on pulling this project off. I'm, uh, I'm interested to find out how you've been able to kind of scale up these very artisan products, um, the Bowers and Wilkins sound systems and Quadrat's textiles to make them more into a kind of, um, I guess, make them available for a mass audience rather than a, a more niche audience that the brands might normally have? Um, well, from our side, I would say we started the discussions with both brands around about the same time. Um, maybe about six years ago, we, we as a Philips TV brand decided that European design is a strong differentiator that we can communicate. Um, and then we dis we start we started discussions with Quadrat initially on a, a non burrs product, but now we're re really coming up with generations of fabrics specific to go together with Philips and Bowers. Mm. Then we discuss with Bowers, and we have a lot of common space, a lot of common um, vocabulary actually, and then tend to create beautiful, uh, sustainable uh, objects of desire that fit into your home are consistent. Mm -hmm across the three brands. So although the scale and application is different, the, the common goal is the same, I would say. Yeah. And to, uh, if I can add to that, I think the, the other thing that you'll notice about everything that we as Bowers and Wilkins do is, is um, brave. I think that will be, that will be one aspect of design that we adhere to, you know, if it's the right thing to do um, from an acoustic performance point of view, in our particular case, then we're, we're happy to embrace it. I mean, these are clearly not what you would call standard rectangular wooden boxes, like a lot of people think loudspeakers are. Um, and the interesting thing I found, uh, or we found working with the team uh, in Philips TV is, is everything kind of aligned, as Rod said, in terms of thought process. You know, there's, there's a celebratory aspect to the design. It's not uh, in any way, shape, or form, apologetic. It's it's the reverse. It's um, you know brave. It's uh, it's it's showcasing and highlighting in an appropriate way uh, the the technologies. Uh, and I don't think we saw that as necessarily um, any form of challenge in in the sense of taking something small scale and making it more mass. It was actually the reverse. It was actually showcasing the value of something small scale to a mass audience. It was celebratory. Like I say, I think is the right word. And Andy, can I ask you as well, um, what does the tweeter bring to the sound experience when you're when you're listening to the sound from the Philips TV? Because I think if you haven't experienced it, what, what does it bring to it? The hi-fi hi industry is full of wonderful words, um, <laughs> some of which people might laugh at. I understand that, right? High frequency is referred to as a tweeter. A low frequency is referred to as a woofer. The mid-range is a word people don't use much anymore. It's a scorecard, believe it or not. So um, we, those are the three. The tweeter is dealing with the high elements, the high sounds, the high frequency elements that make up the full sound picture. Um, placing it inside a box, any form of box, whatever that might be, will influence how it sounds. And, and I can kind of very crudely just do that with my own hands by creating a box around my voice. And you can hear that there's a different characteristic when I do that by putting myself inside a box. So it's a measured modeled behavior that we've we've understood for decades now in fact that if you take um, a drive unit in this particular case a high frequency drive unit and you put it inside a space an enclosure that allows the energy from it to come out into the room freely rather than be wasted inside a box you get better results in the case of the tv that's hugely important because of course some of these screens are quite large um, and the distance between the audio system and the center of the screen can be quite considerable. So what we're trying to do is make sure that the sound that you hear aligns perfectly to the picture quality that you see. And the tweeter mounted in the way that it is inside the product um, massively helps because it creates a freer, uh, more spacious, more open sound, which allows the audio from the audio system to more correctly align to the picture that you're watching. Ah, oh, that's great. Oh, look forward to hopefully hearing it at some point. <laughs> Can I actually ask as well, um, Stina, for Quadrat, um, what was it like for you as a team to have to come up with a fabric that would allow the sound to come through properly, I suppose? Or I, I assume that you hadn't really worked with audio products before this. No, I think we are always on, on a hunt to find out how to push the boundaries for the textiles we are producing. And, and this is, of course, really pushing the boundaries for, for what's, what's possible for, for, for the, the, the textiles we are working with. So it's, 
it's it's extremely nice for us to be allowed to deep dive into a, a new area because it's somehow just unfolding our products even further than that what we thought was was possible and this is of course possible when you have a very precise purpose normally we produce uh, fabrics which should fit to all kind of uh, furnitures for example but here we had like a specific purpose and there therefore we can of course also be very precise I think so, I think also on that it's not to say it was plain sailing f- from day one. To be <laughs> honest, even even right now we're we're finalising next year's fabrics, hmm. and it is a three way discussion. So we are constantly sending fabrics from Denmark to Amsterdam to to the UK and back to test because we think it it's how it appears, but it also how it performs to the hmm. uh, the guys in the in the lab with Burrs and Wilkins. They need to approve it, and the number of threads. Which you can hardly see the difference, but it, there is a big difference. So it's uh, it's very much a collaborative effort. Mm. I think you'd be surprised. You'd be absolutely surprised at how much difference it does make. Um, mm. I think that's some of the um, um, and again, I mean, Rod touched on it earlier on. If you look at the, the the tweet on top on on the two TVs, they share the same grill structure, the grill mesh structure as um, the product behind me. That's not by accident. Um, every every element that gets in the way of sound, and as I said before, that's the obvious example of doing it, um, has to be evaluated. So it, it's been, as, as, as Stina said, a kind of an interesting and, and educational process for all of us whilst we've been mm. working through it, um, because we are well aware clearly that you know, the, the product has to fulfill the requirements of, of Rod and team. It has to fulfill the requirements of everybody from the aesthetic perspective. But at the same time, we also uh, have to make sure that we deliver on our part of the bargain when it comes to the sound quality. So um, everything makes a difference. But by evaluating it, and working on it, we've managed to get to something that we feel very happy with. Mm. And for audiences today, um, as well as wanting premium quality materials and perhaps some more sort of tactile material experiences, even when it comes to um, technology or te- tech design, I suppose. Uh, obviously, sustainability is very important to people, perhaps more so than it's been at any point in, in history, I suppose. How important is that for Philips, um, Bowers and Wilkins and Quadrat? And how do you work together to make sure that the product is as sustainable as possible? It's, it's interesting, actually. So as a brand, it's always been very uh, relevant. And about 10 years ago, we launched a television called the Econova, which was pushing every sustainable measure possible, the recycled aluminium, cork feet, brown box, things, even a solar remote control, uh, elements and details which were bold, I think outstanding, going back to what Andy was saying, but uh, a little bit ahead of its time, I think, and was not really recognised or needed by the, the then consumers. But if you rush forward to now, and especially in the last two years, every brand is basically talking about sustainability on some level and need to be doing so. I think we're all aware of that. So at least from our side, we're very conscious, apart from working with European partners, because it's a, the starting point is intrinsically the same. We also look at uh, companies such as Quadrat because they're using a wool fabric. We use uh, on the same products, you have a remote control, which is a leather uh, back, which is a muir head leather, which is also carbon neutral. So we, we need these conscious decisions to be part of our discussion in order to be uh, recognized as sustainable. And Stina, that's something that's been important for Quadrat as well from the start, I believe. Yeah, it, it is actually something we have always uh, have high focus on. Uh, we have not talked so much about it, uh, but of course, the the time we are living in today is is forcing us, of course, to 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 tell more about it. And it is always a part of our, our product development to to make sure that we every take a step we take in our process, we try to do it a little bit better the next time we, we take the same step. And, and just a, a small example for, for the wool used in, in this product is that just looking a few years back, we were using yeah, four times more water than we do a day today. So it's like really trying to, to optimize our processes every day. Mm-hmm. And, and even though even on top of this, we are recycling 80% of the water we then are using. So it's really a big savior. And, and this is happening every, every day, uh, which of course is, is extremely important for, for everybody. You can say not only this product, but uh, that everybody is, is yeah, uh, 
paying attention to, to the details. Great. Uh, and Andy, what about your, your side of the design? Uh, well, obviously, what we're trying to do is produce products that last. Um, I think there, there are two elements to it in terms of, you know, the, the, the more substantial products such as this. You know, we, we're very fortunate we work with materials that in themselves are quite sustainably uh, sourced and then can be made to last over a period of time in wood being the obvious example, all of which we use is coming from, you know, sustainably sourced woodland in, in northern Europe. Um, the aluminium is easily recyclable. The product itself just tends to last anyway. Working with, with Rod and team, I think the, one of the key points that we emphasize beyond the product itself and the work that we do in that is you're cutting down on the numbers of components and the number of energy consuming components that you need to have in your home by choosing to go with one of these products here, the 936 and the 986, because of course, rather than requiring perhaps an external mains powered subwoofer and an external TV power, uh, it's all in one component. You're actually reducing um, your need for additional energy consuming devices by going for an integrated solution that sort of serves both purposes. And that's mm. sounds like a small thing, but it actually makes quite a considerable difference. Yeah, that's a really interesting aspect. Sorry, Rod, I interrupted, I, I, <laughs> interrupted you. Uh, that's very true. But I think also, at least from our perspective, we're very much on a journey. So the examples given that we just gave are, are, are there. We're also exploring other materials. We've explored wood in the past also for television, but we don't really see any feedback from consumers that it fits with audio, but not so much for television. So it's there isn't a, a one size fits all approach to sustainability across consumer electronics. And whether it's for the packaging or the material um, deconstruction post use, we are learning. So I think what you see from our brand today is, is solid and, and uh, a good story for sure, good products sustainably built but we're ab absolutely not standing still and you'll see coming into next year a lot of changes and expansion of that story okay that's that's exciting yeah look forward to hearing more about that uh and actually as well i was thinking when uh andy when you were speaking with the with the beautiful speaker behind you here in the background how do you feel now um together you've all designed quite a statement tv product that's going to be noticed that's going to be admired in people's homes are we moving away from this idea that the TV should sort of be like an invisible screen on the wall and only come to life when it's turned on? Are TVs and I guess consumer electronics in general becoming more aesthetically important? Uh, I can only speak from our own experience of that, of course. I mean, some of the products that Philips TV would uh, will produce may still be part of that, uh, that uh, other category that you mentioned, but the, the products that we work with, I think are very much that. I think they're, they're celebratory in every regard. I think if you treat it as... Um, perhaps a personal reward is the wrong way to describe it or an indulgence, but something that you feel pride of ownership in, then I think it only seems right and proper to, to celebrate what it gives for you uh, in, in, in the design of the product as well. Uh, we don't, I think also this is important to emphasize, we don't design it for design's sake. It's all there with purpose. It's all there to try to deliver a better sound experience. Um, it's all justifiable in that <laughs> sense, but that the end game is, is very definitely something that's rewarding on a personal and emotional level, because ultimately what do you buy these products for? Whether it's something like that or, or you know, one of the products that we work with our colleagues at Philips TV, you're, you're buying it to entertain yourself. You're buying it to deliver an emotional reward experience. Um, that being the case, the, you know, the more that it's celebrated, the more that it delivers, uh, I would argue that the, the more rewarding the ownership experience becomes. Um, we certainly can't, I think, ever hope to deliver the sound experience that that product is capable of doing in a way that's truly invisible anyway, not that we would even want to. Um, that being the case, we'd rather go the other way and, and, and celebrate it. But I think the same thing does apply with the TVs. They are different, differentiated in their class compared to most of the products that are out there that they compete with. Uh, but we think that's a benefit. Uh, I'd be interested to know what Rod thinks, but I'm sure he agrees. Yeah, I, I think it's true. I think also the reality is that we make these beautiful products, but we have a uh, very much a, a wide uh, range of products from low end to high. And there's, there's uh, diverse trends running, I think, at the moment. There's the reality that people have a year and a half, two years working from home with a lot of technology and in a lot of cases, small apartments, a need for some sort of space, a haven and escape from all the tech when you're not doing your work from home um, part of your day. So there is a reality that some people need the service of a television, communication, information, entertainment, but they also want to be able to switch off. So we're addressing them with some of our products, 
But then it's absolutely correct what Andy was saying, that the other end, such as the products we're talking about today, there is a reality that people want to stand out and enjoy the experience of owning the best, showing it to their friends, because much like a car, when people buy a pair of speakers or buy a high-end television, they want their friends to come over and give them a confirmation that they are doing the right thing and they've bought the right products. So mm. we have to deal with both, but it's a reality of uh, consumer electronics, I would say. Yep. And obviously it also has to be designed to last, like you were saying, as well as being nice to look at, I suppose. Okay. Also, if, if there's too much in the way of decoration or immediate trend following, then it's not going to last. So it has mm. to be intrinsically um, designed for a purpose to fit into a modern home with some length of uh, durability and longevity of choices. Yeah, mm. I think that's very true. And that's something that we've we've um, 100% agreed with in our, in our own experience with products like this as well. I mean, whilst it's tempting sometimes to kind of pursue um, the latest or whatever it might be in terms of materiality, we do tend to kind of come back to a fairly consistent pattern and then try and keep that modern mm. because we find it tends to be I'm not going to say classic, but more, more, just more consistent over time, more durable over time. Mm. Um, and I go back to that point, I think I hopefully mentioned it earlier on, which is this honesty in materials thing that we're, we're very, very keen on as well. So if something looks like metal, it should be metal. If something looks like wood, it should be wood. And you should be able to touch it, feel it and enjoy it and get a kind of almost like a sensual response back from it. Uh, so we we're quite happy to to have you know for example raw uh, or open grain wood structures that you can run your hand down and they feel like a wood rather than something that's sort of highly polished and lacquered but doesn't have that same tactile reward back. Yeah, and obviously with the TVs as well, um, from Quadrat's point of view, I'm I'm curious to find out this idea of tactility. Obviously, your textiles are inherently tactile, but how do you design a textile for something that's um, hard technology products such as the tv what did you what was the design process there and how did you come up with a textile that would that would last yeah i think for me it, it, it is very interesting how textile actually can humanize uh, products like like uh, audio or, or, or televisions uh, it, it because it's like textile create feelings inside us faster than we can create our opinion about it so so it is a quite powerful tool to uh, to put on on a product because it, you as a human being just immediately react to the tactility and i think of course after the the pandemic uh, everybody is like uh, wants tactility and and also the somehow the comfort uh, you add to 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 the feeling of of the full um, uh, product but i would say that the development process has not been so much different it's the, exactly the same to, uh, aesthetic tools you can say we have used it it is it is more in 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 the purpose of of the use of the fa fabric we have taken other decisions than than we normally do uh, in in what way would you are the decisions different than in because we when we for example uh, develop a, a upholstery fabric we have some parameters which we cannot uh, uh, jump over we need to fulfill these and uh, for for uh, making a, a fabric fitting audio we have some other requirements so right. it's, it's more like of a technical uh, level we have taken different decisions but we everything we do we do uh, with with the balance of the external designer we have on our products handwriting and quadrat's dna and that was of course also the aim with with the fabric for for this television yeah that's great um i've actually i've got a couple of good audience questions that i'm going to throw in here as well and we can discuss them um i've got a question for rod uh, from francesca and she asks how do you build a tv that consumers will hold on to for a long time while technical innovations such as 8k smart tvs connectivity with mobile devices etc keep happening at such a fast pace? That's a good question. Um, realistically, for most of our range, we do refresh it on an annual basis. Um, and that's partly because of the reality that a lot of the technology just mentioned there, we don't jump from 4K to 8K every year, but for sure there are tweaks in the specification of the panel, um, which if you don't have the latest spec, then you're, you're gonna struggle to sell it in the store and that's a reality. So we have to create the latest panel technologies into the into the products. But on the other hand, when you're home and you have a normal uh, signal coming through the door, uh, do you see the difference between 4K and 8K? 
I think nobody can get 8K. So then uh, in most cases, it's our job as a design team to create a product which has some length of durability in the overall uh, proportions, use of materials, the quality, the coming together of parts, so it's going to feel good in the hand, it's a remote control. And also as part of the, the living room space, we have the TV is the hub of the home, techni technically speaking. It has to talk to external speakers. So the choices of um, compatible signals running from the TV to the signal uh, to the speaker boxes have to be made in a way that we know will run for several years. Um, but then realistically, the best we can do is design a beautiful product with the best possible choices of technology um, in a quality way that we know will last the, the test of time. I think if yeah. I can have something to that as well, yeah, yeah. modern TVs are not really TVs anymore. They're something else, right? I think that's that's an important point to get across. The, the, the mid-90s cathode ray tube dumb TV is, is a beast of the past, and modern TV sets... Uh, are part home entertainment centers, part computers, part smart devices, and much more besides. And if you look at almost everything that's been produced in the course of the past two to three years, there are certain hard and fast parameters that are not easy to get past. For example, moving from 1080p to 4K to 8K. But there are many others that have actually evolved and rolled in very easily. And I think people sometimes almost forget that or perhaps maybe take it for granted. But, you know, a smart TV perfect example would be the Philips sets, which have recently added Apple TV capability, it can constantly take advantage of that and move forward. There aren't many over the course of the past three or four years that are leaving the customer high and dry without any opportunity to kind of indulge in the latest features. Yes, it's a constantly evolving picture, but at the same time, the brains of these things are significantly more powerful than perhaps people give them credit for. And many of them are able to adapt with the time to move forward and stay relevant even three, four, five years on after purchase. And uh, to add to that, I think also most people using them don't use a fraction of the capability of what they exactly. have. Exactly. And a lot of people um, basically have a remote control full of buttons they don't touch. They, have a, they use the standby button and then Netflix or some other OTT provider and they're mm. off. The, so the, the setup is is very elaborate should you wish it to be so, but most people don't. And then the user or the, the interaction of the smart TV voice control, the capabilities there, but it's, it's there for a very small percentage of the people who actually use those functions. Mm. And all three of you work in companies that design products that are quite tied to the home, um, speakers, TVs, Quadrats fabrics for upholstery, for example. Have you seen, uh, as Andy was touching on, I believe, people being home more during the pandemic, have you seen an uptick in the interest of your products in the last sort of year and a half as people have been more tied to their homes? Yeah, undoubtedly, at least from our side, undoubtedly, uh, people being at home, forced to be at home, there's been a, an unable to travel on holiday. So there is, in some case, quite often there's a disposable uh, income that they can then enhance their living experience at home through whether it be a gaming setup or whether it be a home entertainment system or a best possible viewing experience for the family to watch a movie. Those are areas that have for sure benefited our, some of our categories and similarly for Andy, I'm sure. Yeah, 100%. Does that, sorry. We, we, people can't go to live music. They can't go mm. to the cinema, you know. So um, all of those sorts of things um, have definitely furthered, alongside the point that Rod made about holidays as well. Have definitely furthered the desire for better experiences at home. I'm hoping, of course, that uh, that's a trend that continues. But yeah, very much so. It's been it's been really uh, interesting, actually, to see <laughs> how much um, the, the the interest has increased over the course of the past couple of years. Stina, has it been the same for for Quadrat? We have we have also seen a, a positive journey for our consumer uh, uh, products, uh, but mostly, I would say, it's we see. If, all over from all, all the corners of the world, just a craving for, for tactility. And this is, of course, something we are extremely happy about, uh, that, uh, that people see uh, what, what, what textiles can, can do for their surroundings, uh, not only on furnitures, but also as curtains or room dividers, uh, etc. So uh, a focus on, on creating um, uh, yeah, a comfort feeling, you can say, in, in the interior, but also the possibility of rearranging a room, for example, with, with like curtains in, in a room, uh, which 
people also then you cre create the distance you want, but still with a in a nice uh, sitting. Mm. No, that totally makes sense. I've uh, oh, I've got a question here for Andy. I believe it's quite specific. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> How? Okay, let me get this right. How do you generate decent bass without a subwoofer in the soundbar? Others can't do it. It isn't. Is it an accepted fact for this BMW design, or maybe there is a hidden one behind the screen? Uh, no, it's uh, there is a subwoofer in, in the case of the 936 inside the enclosure. Uh, yeah. It's a 165 millimeter one, if I remember, racetrack design. Um, if you looked at the front of the product, it's uh, slightly to the left of center towards the back of the enclosure and it's ported. So there's an exit airport to the rear. Using the exit airport um, slightly increases the illusion of space within inside the, the, the enclosure. So yes, there is a subwoofer inside the unit. Um, in mm. that case of that particular model, it has uh, four forward firing mid-range drive units, um, three forward firing high frequency units the upward firing Dolby Atmos units, and then uh, a subwoofer. The larger model, the 986, um, doesn't have an integrated subwoofer, but that's because it has significantly larger main drive units. They are uh, 100 millimeter um, drive units, which is quite sub quite substantial for a TV. It's quite substantial for a loudspeaker. Uh, and they're inside uh, three individual fully floating loudspeakers themselves. So what appears to be a single um, enclosure from the outside, aesthetically, if you look at it, is in fact in, internally three separated loudspeakers. So uh, it's they, they both have that capability. The, the really relevant point, uh, and obviously one that Rod, I think, will hopefully thank us for as well, is emphasizing the, the, the quality of the enclosure um, is fundamental to the quality of the picture because a subwoofer, a base drive unit, is something that moves quite a lot and generates mm -hmm. a lot of energy, vibration, that moves through a system um, and that can and would uh, get into the picture and influence the picture uh, were it not for careful attention to detail in design and isolation and both products um, do that very well going right back to the start in fact of the original design concept that uh, Rob and team drove of helping us to try and put the speaker into a separate um, space rather than attaching it to the screen so there is nothing at all um, in or behind the screen from a loudspeaker enclosure perspective, it's all in that separated space. Just, just also to add to that, I think also that we're in our fourth year of, uh, or fourth generation of these ranges. And um, for sure, the first year was more of a challenge to understand for our development team, uh, the need for the finessing in the coming together of the parts in order to overcome exactly what Andy explained. So the way that the metal and the holding brackets and the, the fabric all come together has to be in a way that absorbs and takes the, the amount of power that's going through those units in a way that looks good, but also doesn't rattle mm. being blunt. And uh, we've got a more general question, not from the audience, but from me, I suppose. Uh, and I feel like we've kind of answered this a little bit like throughout this conversation. But how do you continue to innovate in television design when we have such a kind of set idea of what they should look like, that 69 classic ratio? How do you evolve from that, I suppose? Another good question. Um, actually, so as I said, we, we do refresh the identity uh, every year. And from a, a practical, practical point of view, we always start with looking at the, the trends globally, things that are happening um, in society. Obviously, the last two years have been extreme. So the, the reflection of that, well, you'll start to see end of this year into next year in what's coming. Because we see, so basically we start from societal shifts. Then we look at the um, technical changes. So 10 years ago, we were still looking at um, 40 inch, 49 inch, and now 77 inch is a normal screen size. And we have to design for 86 inch and you know larger sizes. So how you in the past there was also a lot of we did a lot of market testing where people wanted the TV to disappear. Well, it's very difficult to make a 77 inch black rectangle disappear. So I think that a lot of people have made made peace with the fact that TV is still very much a center of the home. Um, and how we basically hold in the past, how we held a large bed product in a living corner of a living room and how we do it today has shifted a lot so the use of materials has changed obviously as discussed 
Um, there's always a cyclical change from silver to black every seven years as they kind of people get tired of black, they go to silver and then switch back again, gloss versus matte. So there's some dynamics that are outside of our control. In the end, as a, as a Philips brand, we want to radiate meaningful, meaningfully outstanding products. So we do that by the designing of the stands that lift the TV off the table in a product that doesn't have the sound unit. And with the sound unit, obviously, where it's, it's a much more complex solution but has to be delivered in a, in a way that easily fits into the home. So there's a lot of dynamics. Mm. Um, by now, the bezel itself doesn't need any designing. It does it itself, more or less. And then the last application for us as a brand, obviously, is the Ambilight, how the Ambilight draws the, the user into the experience. Um, and then, obviously, there's a brand signature there, either Philips or Philips, Bowers and Wilkins on the product. So it's it's a long and a lot of words to explain the fact that it's a small change every year, but we have to draw on all the technical and also societal shifts that are happening around us. There's a uh, follow-up question from the audience that kind of uh, asks vaguely the same thing where from Andre, who's asking for odd, as TV design is getting so similar among different brands, I guess you can agree or disagree with that, What's Philip's strategy to stand out and what's the most differentiating factor? It's funny. So uh, maybe I think, I don't know, 12 years ago, uh, internally, we coined the expression sea of similarity. Mm. And that's what you see if you go into an electronic store from 10, you know, 10, 15 meters as you enter the store, you see a lot of rectangles with the same content showing. So um, it, I think it was 2008, actually, that was ex that's when we coined that. And we came up with the position that we need to have a meaningfully unique uh, archetype, or therefore the, the shape that you saw from a distance, to at least draw you up close. So it needs to be meaningful. So the, the designing of the stands is the one uh, aspect from a distance that you can um, be unique by bringing in different forms, materials, combinations of finishings. But then up close, you need to be convinced. So then the coming together of those parts and these new, the 96, the 986 are good examples. So from a distance, they're very unique. And up close, you can see the way that the fabric and the metal come together. You're convinced. The sound demo, if you can get one in the store, also convinces. Uh, the remote control in the hand, the way that uh, you can ergon ergonomically interact with the product, the Android experience. There's, it's a multi-layer experience. But we, as a European design and uh, very much delivering on the principles that we've put in place for European design, have to be uh, inclusive in the way that we interact with the consumer and also inclusive in the way that the product, the TV, interacts with other products around the home, whether it's Wi-Fi speakers or uh, Bluetooth speakers on the go. Mm -hmm. I think obviously Ambilight probably adds that as well, right? And that's another that's another key part to me is is um, it's a very signature um, Philips TV proposition. Um, something that is very interesting. Uh, spending time with it, the, the the Bowers and Wilkins team obviously having to sort of learn the benefits and the allure and the appeal of that technology over time. And none of us um, would be without it now. I think it's uh, mm. that's that's something that's really helped. Um, you know, define an identity beyond everything that Rod's, you know, just just explained, I think, to me, of, of how the product stands out in that sea of similarity. Mm. Also, the, the strange thing is, or the challenge for us, is that in the store, it's a brightly lit space. Yeah. So to show Ambilight is, is difficult. Mm. Um, but as Andy said, a lot of people buy it and then become advocates for it. So then mm. if you had an Ambilight television, you don't want a television without Ambilight. So they're Therefore, that's good for us, but the initial sell is not so uh, yes. straightforward. Yes. But also, if you're adding these kind of more tactile details to the TV, I guess that also really helps it to stand out in a store environment. If you had, like you said, this leather-backed remote, the quadrat textile, and that's something else that customers might be attracted to because it looks a bit different. Exactly. So you need to make some level of uh, presence in the store in order to be attractive. But up close, when you hold that remote control and you, you, you have the tactility of the leather or the fabric, then those are proof points that we're uh, delivering a fantastic experience. Yes. Mm. That's great. I mean, I think that's a really great note to end on, unless there's something that either of you would like to share that you feel we haven't touched on properly, uh, any aspect of the TV design or perhaps working together as a kind of 
cross European team? How's that been in the last year and a half? I guess you've done loads of Zoom meetings. <laughs> um, maybe one thing from my side, I think the exciting thing about this collaboration is that we just before lockdown, we had our first European design coming together. So we basically mm -hmm. gathered together in a meeting room and then tried to, we, we, we made a realization that together we could be much larger than the, the, the individual parts. So the, the collaboration that we can work together across other categories um, it is very strong. So I think it's, and it's business-wise, it's exciting, but also as a, as a design team, it's an opportunity to go wider and benefit from the individual parts coming together and creating something fantastic. How's, how's the experience been for you, Stina and Andy, working together? Um, I, I think that for, for us, it's very much where we see the innovation is that when you start talk, to talk with, with others and, and, and colleagues, uh, other companies, uh, this is really where you can push the innovation because it is uh, difficult to do it as, as a single person uh, and, and maybe also sometimes difficult to, to do it as a single product development. It really helps that there is different parties coming from different backgrounds to help like pushing each other. Uh, of course, when you know a lot about a specific topic, you're also very fast to say, no, this is not possible. But when you are pushed from people who don't have the same knowledge, then you think, okay, yeah, maybe we, we can actually find a way. And I think that's very often the key behind uh, innovation and, and just a positive movement for, for the products we are working with. And I mean, from our perspective, uh, it's, it's what we live for. It's what our company's founded on. Our founder said, you know, if you can always make a better loudspeaker. And, and so we, we like learning. We like trying new things. We like trying to understand them as well. Um, so all of this process is, is over the past three to four years has been about that. And I think what it's taught us is there's still plenty more to learn, if you see what I mean. So there's still plenty more opportunities for us to try and, and push boundaries and achieve more. Um, as Rod also mentioned a little while ago, I think if you look at the prevailing trends in, in, in what customer expectations are, we've still got a lot of scope. There's, there's still potential for screen sizes to continue to increase. As screen sizes continue to increase, then the customer expectation for the audio system that goes alongside it will also increase um, and presents challenges. But challenges, like I say, are something that we look forward to. That's great. Well, I very much look forward to seeing what you all come up with in the future as well. And uh, yeah, excited to see the sort of future collaborations to come. And yeah, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today um, from across Europe and uh, for taking the time to talk us through your new products. And uh, yeah, thank you so much and have a really nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.